This morning's scripture comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 17, and verses 24 through 25. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and was walked and washed and came home seen. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open? they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man? they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been, had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus made the mud and, and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. <coughs> Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. And continuing in verse 24. A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. That's God's word for us this morning. So we are now in our third sermon in this series on how to share our faith. And we've taken as a starting point... This verse, from 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 7, where Paul writes this. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. And I took this as our starting point because I think it's a great reminder of how salvation works and how sharing our faith ought to work as well. We're reminded it's a process. Just like you don't put seed in the ground and the next morning you expect to find an oak tree, same here. It takes time. It's a process. There's planting. There's watering. There's tending. And the hope is one day there is harvesting as well. And so last week, we began by talking about planting seeds of faith. Planting seeds of faith. And we summed up this idea with one word, and that word was intentional. Intentional. Planting seeds of faith is intentionally looking for and creating opportunities to interact with people who aren't Christians yet, who may be irreligious, maybe the last people you expect to see in a church. The idea is, well, what can we do? Let's put together a plan and then go out in the field and get our hands dirty. And we looked at two people from the Bible. We looked at Matthew, the Apostle Matthew. When he became a Christian, almost immediately he wanted to do something for his fellow co-workers and friends who were very irreligious, he wanted them to know Jesus as well. But instead of taking them to the temple or taking them to uh, one of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount or something, he decided to do something that was very natural to his group of friends. And so he threw a big party at his house, threw a big banquet, and he invited all of them to come, and then he decided to invite Jesus and Jesus' followers as well, that they might interact and mingle, rub shoulders, and through those conversations, hopefully plant seeds of faith in these people's lives. We also looked at a woman named Dorca, who used her ability to make clothing as a way to plant seeds of faith in others. 
She would make robes and other articles of clothing for the widows in her community. And so that was her way of showing God's love and showing and interacting with people and giving the opportunities to uh, what I call plant these seeds of faith in their, in their hearts. Well, today, we're moving on from the seeds and we're hoping that over time, God might be growing them into seedlings. Now, what do seedlings need to grow? Well, I would suggest they need at least these two things at a minimum. They need water. They need water. But they don't need just water. As this, Sunday, this Tuesday, Bernie and a couple others and I were, were talking at our the Tuesday men's study, I prayed for water. And afterward, Bernie said, stop praying for water. We got enough water. Pray for sun. All right, so we'll start praying for sun. That's other thing they need. Seedlings need water, and they also need the sun. So what does that look like in the context of sharing our faith? What does it mean to water seedlings, to shed light on them um, as Christians? Well, I think this can be summed up in one word. That word is witness. Witness. Before Jesus rose, uh, ascended to heaven, one of his last things he said to his followers was this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth, Acts 1.8. What did Jesus mean by witnesses? Well, that word basically means the same thing today as it did back then. A witness means you share something that you know, something that you saw, something that you experienced with somebody else. That's what it means to be a witness. Now, I'm guessing probably many of you have been a witness at one time or another. Uh, perhaps you've had to give a police report. I know I've been in a couple of accidents, and I had to, the cops came, and they asked for a report, and I would give them a report about what happened. It was always the other person's fault. It was always their fault, but that was my witness. Right? Now, I simply shared what I knew. I shared what happened to me. It didn't mean that I had all the answers. It didn't mean I had all the information. I'm sure the other person had other information. It's not like the cop came to me and said, oh, that's all I need to hear. I got your information. I'm done. No, you asked others. So I just shared what I knew. I just told my story. And that is kind of what it means to be a witness. You share your story. Now, some of you might be saying, well, wait a second, Lucas. I thought sharing your faith Evangelism was all about sharing God's story. Not your story, sharing God's story. I mean, think about what Jesus said in other Gospels. The Gospel of Matthew, one of his last things he said was, go and make disciples. The end of Mark, he said, preach the good news. At the end of Luke, Jesus said, take this message of repentance to all the nations. So absolutely, we are called to share God's story. But, Jesus also said this in Acts, whoa. You see, my sophisticated system here of books sometimes will fail me, but we're good. At the, end of, at the beginning of Acts, Jesus also said this, that you will be my witnesses. So we are called to share God's story, but we're also called to share our story of faith as well. I want to give you some biblical examples of this, starting with our passage this morning in John 9 where Jesus heals a blind man. And of course, Jesus does this in a very interesting way, doesn't he? he? Jesus, of course, is Jesus. He could just say the word and this guy would be healed. But he spits in the ground, creates mud using his spit, and then puts that mud on the guy's eyes and then says, go someplace else, go to this specific pool and wash there and you'll see. And the guy, to his credit, obeyed, went, washed, and was healed. He could see. And then, of course, something like that is not going to stay hidden. Word got out. People could now see that he could see. People that knew before that he was blind. And so we read this in verses 8 through 10. It says, His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself says, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they demanded. What's your story? What happened? And without missing a beat, he just shared. He was a witness. This is what happened. 
Verse 11. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed, and then I could see. And this opportunity wasn't just with his friends and family, his neighbors. He had an opportunity to share what happened to him even with the authorities, the religious leaders. And so in verse 17 we read this. They turn to him and say, uh, to the blind man, what have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And he said, no, I think he's a prophet. And then a little few verses later, verse 24, a second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. They said, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. And he replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. I don't know about all that stuff. I don't have the answers to all of those questions, but I can tell you what happened to me. I was literally blind. I could not see. And now I can see. He just shared his story. And one says, this is the easiest thing we can do. Just share what we know. You don't have to worry about the tough questions. Sharing what has happened to you. Sharing how Jesus has changed you. That is what it means to be a witness. We also see this in the fourth chapter of John, where Jesus is traveling and he stops at a well in Samaria. And there is a, there a Samaritan woman is, uh, comes and meets him and is getting water from the well. And Jesus strikes up a conversation with her. And they talk about what it means to worship. They talk about living water. They talk about uh, oh, Jesus talks with her about her current living situation. And Jesus says to me, what about, says to her, what about your husband? She says, I don't have a husband. And without missing a beat, she says, that's right. That's right, you don't have a husband, do you? The man you're living with is not your husband, nor the five other men you used to live with, your husband either, right? And she's a little taken aback, like, whoa, who is this guy? How does he know all about him? And this woman ends up being one of the very few people that Jesus directly tells that he is the Messiah. And this conversation with this woman, check out what this woman does immediately after having this encounter with Jesus in John chapter 4, verses 28 through 30. Leaving her water jar, listen, back in those days, the water jars are pretty expensive and those are important. She, I'm leaving it. She left her water jar. The woman went back to the town and said to the people, not to like a person, she, get, gather the people, I have something to share. And she said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And to their credit, the people came out of the town and made their way toward him. And here's the result of all this. In verse 39, we read, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. This woman did the simplest thing she knew. She went and she shared her story. She shared what happened to her. But she took it one more step. She not only shared her story, but then she gave an invitation, didn't she? She said, here's what happened to me. Come and see for yourself. Come and see. And that still works today. When we have opportunity to share our story, to share how our faith has helped us, it's really simple to follow up with a, an invitation. For them to come and see for themselves. Invite them to places and events where they can see Jesus for themselves. Perhaps that's at church. Perhaps that's inviting them to a small group. Perhaps that's inviting them to a particular concert or movie or worship gathering. Who knows? There are many opportunities where Jesus can be proclaimed and heard and seen. So, it's all about sharing your story. That's where it started. Now, my question for you today is, do you know your own story? Do you know your own story? Do you know what you would say 
If someone asked you, well, what's, what's, your, what's your faith? What do you believe? Now, you know before a witness takes the stand in, the, in a courtroom scene, their lawyer has worked with them. So they know what to say and how to say what it is they're going to say. The lawyer doesn't say, I just go out there say whatever. I trust you. I'm sure the other lawyer won't say anything, you know, puzzling. No, they make sure that he or she knows what to say. So do you know what to say? What would you say if someone asked you, well, how did you become a Christian? What do you believe? You know, there's something different about you. What's, what's different? What would you say if you only had 30 seconds, a minute? What would you say? Here's what I would say. If I'm on an elevator ride up at Allegiance and someone sees my something, I don't know, somehow they, they realize I'm a Christian, they say something. How'd you become a Christian? Well, I would say in high school, I was very insecure. I felt like I needed to have all my friends' approval. And I'd get easily angered, I would get depressed because I placed so much value on what others thought of me. I asked my mom for verification. I usually took it out on her. But through Jesus, I discovered that the only approval I needed was God's approval. And the amazing thing was, I didn't have to work for that approval. I didn't have to perform. I didn't have to be somebody else to get it. Because God gives it to us freely through Jesus. And what he did for us on the cross. And I can tell you, since I became a Christian and started following Jesus, I have become much more secure. I've become much less dependent on what others think of me. Because I know I am completely loved, accepted, and approved in Jesus. That's what I would say, something just along those lines. Very short. That's my story. That's what my life was like before I became a Christian, before I started following Jesus. That's how I came to follow Jesus, and that's how my life has changed since following Jesus. And those are the three ingredients to everybody's story, including your story as well. What was your life like before you became a Christian? How did you come to follow Jesus? And what's your life been like afterward? What difference has it made? These are the three ingredients for everyone's story, including folks in the, in the Bible as well. Take the Apostle Paul. We actually can hear his story a couple of different places in the Bible. I want to share with you his testimony from Acts chapter 22, where he is standing before a crowd, and he has an opportunity to share his story of faith. So as I read Acts 22, follow along. You will see these items here in this order. Paul said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. Under Gamil, I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecute the followers of this way, that is, Christianity, to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. So also the high priest and all the council can testify. I even obtained letters from them to their brothers in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord, I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus, because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was an devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our fathers who has chosen, has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking. Quick, he said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately, because they will not accept your testimony about me. 
Lord, I replied, these men know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of, the, of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Well, in that story, that testimony, Paul shares what his life was like before he became a Christian. He was a devout follower, he was a devout Jew, and he was persecuting Christians. But of course, he also talked about how he became a Christian in that miraculous story of Jesus appearing to him on the road to Damascus in that brilliant light, calling him to follow him. And then he shares what his life has been like since. How he has been called by God to be his witness. And how he's been persecuted now for doing this. Life before Christ, how he came to know Jesus, and how his life has been changed ever since. Sharing our stories on how we became a Christian, sharing our stories of how our faith has helped us, perhaps when a loved one has passed or helped you raise your children, or given you some joy, peace, contentment, stories of how God has answered your prayers, all of these can be natural opportunities to share and water the seeds of faith with others. Here's another example I read about this week, about... Um, a guy and his co-worker. Uh, Jerry is asked by his work colleague, Bill, how his weekend went. Jerry relates that he went on a men's retreat that provided spiritual resources for forgiving people who have wronged us over the years. When Bill raises his eyebrows and says, that's interesting, Jerry takes a small plunge and mentions that the thing that helped him most was the idea that even though he has not given God his due, God offers him forgiveness through Christ. Look for opportunities to water seeds of faith. These stories are what help people grow in their faith. It helps them to see that spiritual matters aren't just about something that happened 2,000 years ago with no impact today. Your stories help them make sense of the faith. They can kind of see it for themselves. And that's what we're trying to do with this four-week workshop. In fact, in a couple of weeks, we're going to take a, an evening, we're going to do, put together our own stories. And we're going to work on this in a little bit more depth. So I encourage you to join us this Tuesday at 6.30. At 6.30. Um, even if you missed the first one, uh, you, there's still a lot to gain for each individual session. Now, earlier, I mentioned that... Seedlings need two things to grow, at least. Water is one, but the other is the sun. They need light. So I want to finish the sermon by just briefly saying this. It doesn't do much good for you to water plants in a closet where there is no light, where there is no sun. And it can do you much good at all. Seedlings need light to grow. And in the context of sharing our faith, your life is that light. Your life is that sun. Living a true, authentic, passionate Christian life, there is nothing more attractive than men or women who love God and love others, who live for God and live for other people passionately and authentically. In fact, this is what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And usually that praise your Father in heaven is in the form of, well, what is different about you? How come you're doing this for, for me? How come you're doing this at all? What, why are you... Happy all the time. What is what? What's wrong with you? Opportunities to share our faith, to shine light into their lives, and they can, huh? Okay, interesting. And you hope that it eventually brings praise to Father, to the to to our Father. Your story, your testimony is powerful, but it is even more powerful when it is backed up with a life that matches, a life that is lived for God. A, your faith story plus a passionate life for God 
equals a powerful, powerful witness that can and will help seedlings of faith continue to grow toward God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we have the Bible. This is your story. The last book of it was written more than 1,900 years ago. And yet it's amazing that it continues, in a sense, to this day. That our stories are a part of it. That we are part of your great story. That we can share what you have done in our lives. How our lives used to be like. How we came to know you. And what our lives have been like since. How they've been changed. How they've been transformed. Father, I pray that you would help each of us to know our own story. I pray that you would give each of us kind of a radar. Look for opportunities. Hit us over the head when opportunities come. And we have the opportunity to share our story, to share uh, an answer to prayer, share how, something you've done in our life with others. And who knows, that may kick off even deeper conversations. Father, help us to know your story, help us to know our own stories, and give us the courage, the excitement to share what you have done in our lives with others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.